Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. The record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1-800-534-8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Aurit Connor. I'm your host, Aurit Connor. Today is Friday the 13th of November 2015, and I want all of you to throw away your superstitious feelings and tendencies uh, today. Just treat it like any other Friday. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, treat it as if Pirates Week is on its way, and uh, that should uh, let you feel better as well. Um, I want to say that For the Record is a show produced by the staff and management of Radio Cayman, geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out on the local, regional, and international scene. I am your host, Dorit Connor, and you're welcome to join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7.30 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. Our phone lines are always open. There is always someone there waiting to take your calls. Normally, it's that beautiful voice of Miss Susan Watson. You can join in the conversation by calling us on our toll-free number, courtesy of Lime. That number is one 800 534 8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. Uh, and you notice this morning I said lime instead of flow. And the reason I did that said that was because I went yesterday to pay my phone bill and I had uh, written the check out and I put on the check uh, lime slash flow. And they said, oh, you can mark the flow out and just leave the lime there because we still lime cable and cable and wireless. I guess the account is that way. So I'll still continue to call them lime as well. I guess I'm not sure whether or not flow has more to do with the um, uh, TV side of things um, as well. But you are certainly welcome to join us. And uh, we know that we ha are have a huge following of our listeners out there uh, we know that based on the number of calls that we get sometimes and we also know it based on the comments that we receive on the street about the show um, as well uh, this morning uh, we are pleased to have in the studio with us oh before i do that before i do that while you're still on the road i want to say to you drive carefully on the roads there apparently is a small uh, a little small vehicle uh anywhere from uh Kent Rankin's place in Bodentown all the way down to Northward every morning. We're getting drivers complaining that that vehicle is driving in the wrong lane. So they're going towards town, but they're heading in the right lane, crossing all of the traffic. Apparently, it's a female driver there, and that driver needs to understand that they're putting other people's lives at risk. Uh, I'm hoping someone is going to be sending me the... Uh, license plate number of that vehicle, and we're going to name and shame on the air, at, at least as far as the license uh, plate goes. But I'm also made to understand that reports uh, have been made to the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service. I believe someone tried to call in again this morning about it. And people need to understand, if you don't care about your safety, then consider the safety of others. I know that may be asking a lot of you because... Uh, you should really be caring about yourself first and foremost. And if you don't do that, then, uh, you know, I find it difficult that you'll care for others. But something needs to be done uh, with that driver. And uh, if anyone from the Royal Police, Cayman Islands Police Services uh, is listening in, then we would encourage you to monitor that stretch of road before 7 o'clock in the morning. I believe it's probably somewhere around about quarter to, between quarter to 7 and 7 o'clock. Monitor that stretch of the road so we can get that crazy driver um, off the road. Uh, so this morning, we have the pleasure of having in the studio with us Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the courts administrator. And as I gave you a preview earl, um, earlier this week, uh, he will be talking about the court system. I want to alert and remind our listeners that we will be taking calls, but we will not be discussing 
current cases, past cases, or future cases as well. That Those are all off limit. Uh, Mr. McCormack is here this morning. We want to talk about the uh, judicial system. We want to give you an idea of how it works so those of you who have to navigate uh, the judicial system either for criminal proceedings, hopefully not, for civil proceedings or otherwise, that it helps you. In order to give you a true picture, a clear picture of the whole situation, we're going to talk about the courthouse and the facilities there. Uh, we'll talk about the range of cases dealt with, but we won't talk uh, about specifics. We will talk about the resources available uh, through the uh, the website, um, the Judicial Services website, not, not the Judicial Services Commission's website, but uh, the Judiciary's re website. We'll talk about initiatives. Um, uh, for instance, the problem-solving courts, the uh, alternative dispute resolution, and we're also going to be talking about the new sentencing guidelines that have recently been issued uh, by the Chief Justice. So, Mr. McCormack, without any further ado, ado I want to say good morning and welcome to For the Record, sir. Good morning. Thank you, O.C. Pleasure to be here. Sure. Well, uh, first, uh, we can. Uh, I'd like you to tell our listening audience about yourself in terms of the post of um, courts administrator. Thank you. Yes, I'd, um, I've grown up in the court service in England. Um, I spent about 25 years working in magistrates' courts there, having qualified as a lawyer, and then working in the management of magistrates' courts, um, working in the courtroom and in the office side of the business too. Then I had 10 years in central government, working for the Ministry of Justice in London, primarily around sentencing for criminal offences and developing policy in that area. And um, as, a, as a courts administrator here, you're almost uh, the equivalent of a chief officer in, in that uh, yeah. section? It, yes, it is the chief officer for judicial administration, so responsible for uh, the whole of the administration, both strategic and, and operational. Okay. And in, in the time frame, Mr. McCormack, that you have been here in the Cayman Islands and involved in judiciary and uh, with the judiciary, judiciary sorry, um, how have you seen it evolve over those years? I, I think the pattern for the courts here over the last 10 years or so has shown that there has been a substantial increase in the volume and the complexity of the work that has had to be managed through the court system. Everyone will know that the court itself was built almost 40 years ago. And from what I've been told, it had two courtrooms at that time, and many people thought it was an extravagance to have that many uh, rooms available. We now operate across two buildings. We have seven separate courtrooms. We also have judges' chambers in which we can hear cases. And most days now we are operating 10 or 11 separate court hearings. So the whole system has had to cope with all the problems that that level of volume brings, covering the whole range of business from the traffic tickets through to the multi-million dollar international financial disputes. Okay, and talking about inter, uh, international uh, financial disputes, um, how are we viewed um, as a as a jurisdiction in terms of our judicial system uh, for international disputes? Uh? Yes, we, we we have a high reputation. The, the judgments of the court are referred to by other jurisdictions, and there is a lot of interest in what happens here. Through the judicial website, people can have access to the judgments of the court, whether they're published formally in the Cayman Islands Law Report or whether they're published just as the judgments on the day. And the number of people we have subscribing to the website to get access to those from all over the world, from the Far East, from Europe, from North America, is huge. 
Okay, before we before we start to talk about the um, the courthouse itself and the facilities and um, the the future of the uh, buildings and even the location, um, for again for the benefit of our listening audience, can you? Outline the various tiers of the court system, starting probably with, uh, I don't know, juvenile court and going uh, all the way up. Yes, we have um, three basic levels of court, the summary court, the grand court, and the court of appeal. Within the summary court, uh, there's a range of business that's undertaken, the straightforward criminal and the civil work. Um, and for the criminal work, that is split between adults and youths. So there is a separate court that deals with 17 and under uh, and that deals with adult offenders. We also have the coroner's court. And this week we have that court sitting in Cayman Brac. Uh, there are a number of inquests to be held there. And so from time to time, we will have those sittings in one of the sister islands. The, the summary court itself sits there once a month for, for two days and deals with a wide variety of criminal and civil. So within the civil side of the business too, there, there is the general civil matter, but there are also family proceedings uh, which deal either with the payments and maintenance between adults or with difficult decisions regarding the care of children, um, either through proceedings started by the DCFS or because of the breakdown of a family relationship and there needs to be resolution of how the child is cared for, children are cared for after that. Mm -hmm. So um, summary court has a wide jurisdiction um, on the criminal side, can impose substantial penalties, can deal with substantial financial disputes, but the more serious cases are dealt with in the grand court. And in the grand court in a criminal case, and a defendant who wants to be not guilty can opt for that to be before a jury. Um, or just before the judge. And the Grand Court, again, has a wide variety. It has three separate um, specialist divisions, the Family Services, uh, the Family Division, the Financial Services Division, and the Admiralty Division, alongside the General, Criminal, and Civil Division. Appeals from the Grand Court go to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal sits in the islands typically for three sessions a year, mm -hmm. each of three weeks. Okay, and within all of those those three different layers of the courts, how many uh, judges uh, do, uh, are we dealing with there? Uh, and how many, uh, and you don't have to give the precise number, but uh, do we have some that are resident here and then some, um, you know, who are transitory? Yes. In the summary court, um, the magistrate who sits in the, the summary court, we have a chief magistrate and two permanent full-time magistrates. Mm -hmm. We also have five um, acting magistrates who sit as required, and typically, most days, we have at least two of those sitting in court. All of those are resident on the island. In the Grand Court, we have the Chief Justice, and we have three other permanent full-time judges, mm -hmm. and we have four other part-time permanent judges who sit only in the Financial Services Division. Supporting those judges, we have a panel of currently, I think it is 12 acting judges, and all but one of those are based off island and will come to the island and sit as required. Throughout certainly this year and for most of last year, we have at least one acting judge present at any one time. Um, and th they typically will come for a period between three weeks and three months. Um, Many of the criminal cases, which is what they tend to deal with, uh, will be lasting two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, and so it is good to have a judge here for that continuous period. All the Court of Appeal judges are, are based off Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, there are seven. And the, the current president, Sir John Chadwick, is, is on Ireland for the current session, which will be his final session on the island. And he will be retiring as president early in 2016. Okay. Certainly we have been very fortunate to attract to the Court of Appeal some extremely high caliber justices, uh, both regional and from from England and Wales. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I am your host, Orit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the court's administrator. We're discussing the judicial system in the Cayman Islands. When we return, we're going to talk about uh, the court facilities, uh, the age of those facilities, um, the limitation of those facilities, and what lies ahead in the future for them. Please stay tuned. We'll be back short. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. I am your host, Dorit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the court's administrator and the chief officer um, uh, there as well. Uh, before we get back to the discussion, I promised you that we would tell you more about that vehicle that drives erratically. I shouldn't say erratically. They're um, on the wrong side of the road crossing a whole line of traffic every morning um, in the... Um, Bordentown Northward area from about uh, Kent Rankin's house all the way down to Northward. Uh, it is a, looks like a, either a white or a silver Hyundai or Hyundai as um, Hyundai or Hyun, uh, Hyundai as we colloquially say. The license plate number, it's like I said, it's name and shame. 161 248 is the license number. And the only reason that I'm giving this out is because this person is putting people's lives at risk, especially families that are transporting their children to school so early in the morning. License plate number 161248, silver or white Hyundai. Okay, that's enough for naming and shaming this morning. Going back to Mr. McCormack, uh, some time ago when uh, a government had an ambitious project of building a courts building and uh, a police uh, station in the what we call the halfway pond area. Uh, then as a result of financing, I believe that they'd gone to the point of where uh, plans had been uh, prepared and everything for the building. That was dropped uh, because of uh, financial reasons. Uh, where are we now with new facilities? We know that at this point in time, you sprayed over. You're still in Kirk House yes, um, we as well. Uh, and do we still utilize the town hall at times yes, also? We do. Yes, yes, we do. Okay, I'll hand over to you then, sir. Thank you. Yes, um, th the new court development um, had to be shelved around about 2008. And we still have the plans for that building as it was developed then. Since then, the, the volume of work that is undertaken has expanded even more. But I'm pleased to say that Cabinet has approved in principle mm -hmm. the process of moving forward on a new court facility. And we are just at the point of letting a contract to consultants to draw up the outline business case. And if all goes to time, that should be ready to go back before Cabinet early in 2016. So once a decision is made on that, we will be able to start on the best available option. Uh, currently under consideration, that there are a variety of possibilities. Certainly the halfway pond site is still uh, unoccupied. It's not being used for any other purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has its, its advantages and disadvantages. There are also some possibilities within the center of Georgetown um, that are going to be considered seriously. And there will be a number of others, I'm sure, which the consultants will assist us in identifying for the future. And there's certainly, um, we need something dramatically better than what we have at the moment. Okay. Now, I know you're not an architect, but uh, similar to what we've seen in terms of the design of airports after 9-11, uh, and we've seen instances in uh, here in our local courts where people have been found to, uh, to be carrying contraband inside uh, the court's uh, building. Uh, so you have a screening process there yes, we do. Uh, uh, when it comes to the holding of prisoners and everything else. Um, has anything changed in terms of the design of uh, courthouses? Yes, uh, the, there is a lot of experience in developing and building courthouses both in North America and in England and Wales. 
the way that we operate our courts is is closer to the English model than to the American model in mm -hmm. terms of how the attorneys are presented, where uh, the parties to proceedings sit, mm -hmm. and how the proceedings are conducted. And certainly in the last 25 to 30 years, there has been a lot of court building in England. And although there is no standard design guide, there has been a lot of thought given to how you can construct a building that provides safe circulation routes for all the different parties. So we need to provide good circulation routes for members of the public, for those attending court hearings. We need to provide separate circulation routes for judges, for magistrates, for staff. And we need to ensure that prisoners, those who are in custody for one reason or another, are kept secure and, and safe. And everyone has good access to the right sort of facilities for the type of case that they're dealing with. If we're dealing with a criminal case, um, particularly one with a number of defendants or one that um, has high security elements, you need a very different type of room mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from if you're dealing with family proceedings or proceedings involving a young person. So our expectation is that the new facility will have a mix of types of courtroom, hearing spaces, um, will have much better waiting facilities for the public will provide us with the opportunity to have separate areas for the victim of crime mm -hmm. if they choose to attend mm -hmm. court mm -hmm. uh, for witnesses especially for jurors at the moment the the facilities that we can offer our jurors are poor uh, they um, they give up considerable amount of time and devote considerable energy to this very important role in deciding guilt or innocence in serious criminal cases. Uh, and we ask a great deal of our jurors, and it's disappointing that we've not been able to provide them with the quality of facilities that they need. Very grateful to them for their willingness to keep going throughout their session um, and to make conscientious decisions <coughs> in very difficult circumstances. Okay, uh, you, you were probably reading my mind there when you switch right over to jurors because we want to talk about that. Um, uh, having been involved in the um, electoral process on the administrative side, uh, we, we know that uh, the courts rely on the uh, register of electors to select um, uh, jurors. Uh, we have seen some reluctance from people one, um, in terms of not wanting to register because they would be chosen as uh, jurors. And we, in the past, encouraged them to register because we also encouraged them that it was their civic duty uh, also to serve as, as jurors. Um, so that we saw as one, one of the um, reasons that people didn't want to register as electors but in terms of the when those now those persons who are selected or are called to appear for ju jury duty um, what can they expect what are they uh, paid on a daily basis there are some who will get paid and some who won't for instance I, I believe if someone if a person is a, a public servant a civil servant because the government will cover their salary they probably are not re remunerated for uh, jury work that they've done but you've talked about this the civic duty aspect of it let's talk a little bit more about that I think we have about four more minutes before we go to um, to the news so uh, you know, we can talk a little bit about that now. Yes, thank you. We have um, a pool of jurors. Um, just over 120 are called every three months. Okay. And that pool has to be available for the whole of that three months, um, a session of the Grand Court. And um, they will be called in at the beginning of the session. Mm -hmm. There will be an introductory presentation to them. So that will help each juror to understand more of what is expected of them and what the rates of payment are. The, the, the reason for the payment is not so much as a, a salary. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's more to recompense those who will be losing income as a result of having to be on the jury. Okay, yes. um, employers are under an obligation to release people for jury service and not to discriminate against them mm -hmm. as a result of their t 
time on a jury service, as you and say. that would include salary discrimination, I would imagine. Yes, right? it would. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it. it um, I mean, clearly, people are paid on a different basis. Some are paid salaries, uh, annual salaries. Some are paid for the hours that they work. Others are paid um, on the basis of commission, um, or in some other way, which can be hugely influenced if you're not available to be at your place of work. So we certainly recognize that for some people, the financial consequences, particularly if you become part of a jury for a case that is going to go on mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. four or six weeks. Uh, we have two cases that are starting, um, one probably starting in a week or so, another early in the new year, that are scheduled to last for about six weeks. Um, now that is obviously a very significant commitment yes, for yes. anyone. Yes. Um, so, uh, social media. We, when we come back, we want to talk about social media and and jurors as well, because we see in other jurisdictions where mistrials uh, as a result of jurors not being aware of what they can and can't do, and some who are addicted to social media <laughs> and as a result can't help themselves. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the courts administrator and also the chief officer in the uh, Department of Judicial Services. I want to remind you that our phone lines are open. You can call us on our toll-free number, 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. We welcome your calls. If there's anything that we haven't touched upon yet, please feel free to call in. Just remember, we will not be discussing individual cases present, past, or future. Please stay tuned. We're going to the news. When we come back, there'll be more informative information for you. We're here with Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the chief officer and also the courts administrator in uh, the Judicial Administration Department. Um, And we're talking about the court system here in the Cayman Islands. You never know when you may be involved in the court system, either uh, hopefully not criminally, but, um, you know, civilly or otherwise. Some of you may encounter that erratic driver that we're talking about and uh, may have to go in as a witness or or, uh, hopefully not uh, a victim of uh, that person's erratic driving, you know, as well. When we left for the commercial break, I promised you that we would be talking about uh, the... um, uh, prevalence of social media throughout the world and of course here in the Cayman Islands as well and whether or not that presents any challenges uh, when it comes to jurors uh, and their communications while they're serving as jurors, Mr. McCormack. Yes, thank you. So the job of any court, whether it's a jury or whether it's a judge or magistrate sitting alone, is to make their decision on the basis of the information that is put before them Mm -hmm. by the parties. Over the last years, we've seen such a growth in social media, we can find out almost anything we want to one way or another. And it has been very tempting for jurors to think about doing some research uh, Mm -hmm. which will supplement what they have been told in court. There were one or two high-profile cases in England where jurors have done that, um, and the judge has had to take a very severe line with those jurors. um, And it is very important that anyone who serves on a jury restricts themselves to the information that is put before them in the courtroom. Uh, They resist the temptation to go and look up things that um, may be out there on the internet or through other some source, uh, which may give them additional or different information from what they have been told. Okay. Um, And and sticking with the whole uh, issue of jurors, being such a small jurisdiction population of just over 55,000. How challenging uh, has it become uh, when, uh, in terms of uh, jury selection? Uh, and this will be a, a two-barrel question because the other part of it also is that uh, uh, we see in other jurisdictions where jury selection itself 
becomes almost a science for uh, either the prosecution or for the defense, uh, and, and whether or not we're seeing that uh, occurring here in the Cayman Islands as well. Yes, we have had relatively little difficulty considering the potential that there has been for problems. As far as I can recall, in the time that I have been here, there have only been two or maybe three occasions when we have had to call in extra jurors over and above the normal pool that we call at the beginning of each session. We do have the power, uh, if we need to, simply to go out onto the streets and to require people to come in and start to sit on a jury um, straight away. Mm -hmm. Not something that we would like to do. Uh, we have very, very occasionally had to do that when we have a case that's ready to go and we've run out of jurors from the pool. Normally, in a criminal case, the jury will consist of seven people. That's smaller than, than in England and Wales, so that uh, makes the task a little easier. For the more serious cases, we will have 10 or, or 12 jurors, um, and obviously that is a bit more challenging. But in practice, we have managed to have the right number of jurors for every case that we have needed them. Mm -hmm. And for, for a juror or a person who's a potential juror who is retired, for instance, and um, has time on their hand and wants to contribute to society and mm -hmm. uh, help as far as the judicial system is concerned, is it difficult to continue to select that person over and over if they're willing to? Uh, would it be perceived as, well, that this person is really, just like we sometimes have professional mourners, we have a professional juror? <laughs> yeah, the track record for professional jurors is not that great. Um, <laughs> those who know their ancient history can remember back to the days in ancient Athens um, where that system rapidly fell into disrepute mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. for a whole host of reasons and obviously life has moved on quite considerably since those days. But the the essence of jury selection is that there is a, a large element of randomness about it, that um, everyone who is eligible um, should be brought in at some stage, that the the nature of the jury should not be predicted. You, we are not looking for people who become experts or experienced in it because one of the strengths of the jury is that it brings a fresh pair of eyes and um, can look at evidence and information using all the experience that the jurors have accumulated through their lives. And we ask them really to use the sort of skills that everyone uses every day to assess who is telling the truth, um, to assess what is the most likely sequence of events in any given circumstances on the basis of the information presented to them. Okay, we want to move on to the independence of the judiciary here um, in the Cayman Islands. And uh, I have a copy of uh, the Cayman Islands Constitution Order 2009 uh, that I'll be uh, thumbing th through in a, in a few minutes uh, to ask a question in relation to our compliance uh, you know, with our Constitution as far as uh, the dispensation of justice is concerned. Yes, having a strong, independent judiciary is an essential element of any strong society. We have seen all over the world that if anyone wants to start to impose a dictatorship or some strong single source of government, one of the first targets is the judiciary. And if um, someone who wants to rule in that way wants to undermine society, they will often seek to undermine the judiciary. The Constitution, established in 2009, is a robust one. It provides for a, an independent process for the appointment of judges mm -hmm. and of magistrates. Um, the appointment is by Her Excellency the Governor, but that appointment follows a process of application assessment interview conducted by an independent body, 
the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, mm -hmm. which then makes recommendations to the governor. So there is a very good balance between the importance of attracting and retaining able and experienced individuals, but having the process of appointment done in a way that focuses on that ability and independence rather than on any other feature. Um, it's important also that we see that judges have security of office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it is common in many jurisdictions as here to protect the salary of judges and magistrates so that government can't influence the judiciary simply by reducing their salary mm -hmm. or by threatening to mm -hmm. reduce mm -hmm. their salary. We have seen recent examples of that in, in some African countries where um, those in positions of power have dramatically reduced the salaries of judiciary with the inevitable effect. Um, but it's also important that once a judge or magistrate is appointed, they know that that appointment will continue. They are not put in a position where people may think they are tempted to make a decision in favour of the government because they know they have a contract coming up for renewal. So all those elements together the Constitution provides for um, and sets up and provides a very strong basis for an independent judiciary here. <clears throat> so, so when we look at other jurisdictions, uh, for instance, where uh, judges, um, are the positions are elected positions, uh, when you compare them to what we have, mm. certainly uh, ours is certainly um, uh, less free from influence and interference in that regard based on what you've said. Yes, it, it is. The process of electing judges has its strengths, mm -hmm. um, but it does mean that ultimately the, the judge is accountable to the electorate. And whilst that has its benefits because it ties in the work of the judiciary with the needs of the society, it also runs the risk of a judge who is seen as particularly popular or particularly harsh or particularly one thing or another as being more likely to be re-elected. Um, and the decision has to be made by every judge in every case on the basis of the information and in accordance with the law. Okay. When we look at Section 26, Subsection 1 of our Bill of Rights, um, um, and it's headed uh, Enforcement of Rights and Freedoms, and it reads, any person may apply to the Grand Court to claim uh, that government has breached or threatened his or her rights and freedoms under the Bill of Rights, and the Grand Court shall determine such an application fairly and uh, within a reasonable period uh, of time. Uh, again, with the um, introduce, introduction of a new constitution, uh, have we seen people taken advantage of this now in our court system? Yes, but to, to a small extent. Mm -hmm. um, the, the anticipation was that we could have a large number of applications yes. in the early days, and there are some very important provisions there, for example, the right to, um, to family life. Um, how will, does the immigration law interact with that particular mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure is an issue that will eventually come before the court. The, the pattern that has followed here is very similar to the pattern that followed the introduction of the equivalent legislation in England and Wales, where before the law came in, everyone was expecting there would be a large number of applications coming before the court. That didn't happen immediately, mm -hmm. but over a period of five, six years, we started to see more and more applications coming in that may be based entirely on the provisions in the Constitution, but more often use those provisions to supplement other arguments. Um, so maybe it is a right to fair trial. Maybe it's one of the other provisions that is allied with other arguments um, within the, the other provisions of the law. Okay. Switching gears again. Uh not many people know how to drive standard transmission cars these days, but <laughs> we're driving one here this morning. We want to talk about the uh, new sentencing guidelines, and I'm going to take the uh, opportunity to read uh, some of the Chief Justice's uh, comments, the Honorable uh, Anthony Smelly, uh, in relation um, 
uh, to uh, to it, his foreword, and it says it is now part of the modern day reality that criminal offenses in the Cayman Islands are very broadly defined and involved different levels of seriousness and complexity. The manner in which the courts deal with criminal offenses must reflect this reality, and the sentencing guidelines are intended to assist the judges and magistrates in deciding upon the appropriate sentence for criminal offenses. It has often been said that sentencing is an art, not a science. Certainly, it is often the point in a case where a wide range of factors come together and where there are competing priorities, including the need to punish, to deter, and to rehabilitate the offender. As the circumstances always vary, cases which often look the same at first glance are very different when the details are known. For many years, it has been recognized in the Cayman Islands that guidelines are an important way to shape the exercise of the necessary discretion that the judge or magistrate must possess in order to do justice in the case. They provide a framework for the proper exercise of judicial discretion, promoting consistency of approach and enabling attorneys to know more clearly those issues which a court will consider important when assessing the seriousness of an offense. The previous guidelines in 2002 were well received and have provided a framework for the assessment of culpability and harm that has, provided in, uh, has proved invaluable. However, since then, we have seen the, the creation of many formal guidelines in England and Wales initially through the Sentencing Guidelines Council and Sentencing Advisory Panel, and more recently through the Sentencing Council. Those guidelines have been regularly refer referred to and adopted by the courts into the laws of the Cayman Islands with appropriate adjustments. So uh, that last sentence tells us we didn't, he didn't really, or we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, tell us about what we had uh, pr if you know prior to 2002, what we had in 2002, what we have now as far as the gu guidelines are concerned, because I, I, in reading through them, uh, they seem to be very revolutionary. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some people will have some issues with some parts of it, because here in the Caribbean, we have a tendency to be hard line when it comes to, um, to crime and, and punishment. Thank you. Yeah, the, the 2002 guidelines set out the general approach to sentencing for the more serious offences that commonly occurred within the jurisdiction. Since 2002, the principles of sentencing that are commonplace in England and Wales gradually came in to the law here through decisions of the court. So what these guidelines are doing is is bringing the, together the general principles of sentencing, setting them all down in one place so it's easy for people to see, people from outside the system, um, easy for judges who come in from other jurisdictions to know the principles mm -hmm. along which we work. So um, one of the uh, main developments over the last 10, 15 years has been the reduction in sentence for pleading guilty. Yes. Now... That is always something that sometimes puzzles people. Uh, why should you get uh, a reduction in sentence for pleading guilty? If you are guilty, surely you should plead guilty. Um, but everyone is entitled to plead not guilty. They're entitled to say to the prosecution, you prove the allegations against me. Mm -hmm. um, that is part of uh, our rights as citizens and part of the obligations on the prosecution to do so. Where a person pleads guilty, it saves considerable anxiety for those who might otherwise be called as witnesses, um, particularly for the victim of crime, because if that plea can be entered very quickly, it brings the case to a conclusion, mm -hmm. the individual can move on. If there is compensation or restitution due, that can start to be paid straight away. Uh, obviously, there are benefits too in court time. Uh, the more people who plead guilty, the more cases we can deal with more quickly, and therefore the quicker we can get to those cases where there really is a dispute. So the practice has evolved here, as in England and Wales, over time. 
um, that the person who pleads guilty is likely to get a lesser sentence than the one who doesn't. The earlier you plead guilty, the greater that reduction is likely mm -hmm. to be, mm -hmm. up to a maximum of about one third. So those types of principles have been brought in, they've been set down, um, and one aspect that I think has been particularly helpful that is new here but has been in England and Wales for a while is how you approach sentencing for offences that take place within the context of a domestic relationship. Mm -hmm. Domestic mm -hmm. violence is clearly an important issue. And in the curve beyond the rules. It certainly is, yes. yeah. A lot of times ignored. So we have adopted two approaches for that. We, we have a specialist problem-solving court uh, that deals with domestic violence. It's one of three problem-solving courts where we recognize that in order to change life for the better, you can't just deal with the offense. You've got to deal with the causes of the offense. So we know that many people who commit drug-related offences or dishonesty offences, sometimes public order, minor offences, do so because they have an addiction to drugs or because they have a mental health problem. If we don't deal with the addiction or with the mental health issue, then the offender will continue to commit offences. So we now have a formally constituted drug court that um, brings together the, um, the health services, all the facilities that are available to assist people. Mm -hmm. um, they, if they wish to do so, come into a program where they are continually tested. They are brought back before the court regularly to account for whether they are testing positive or negative. And over a period of time, we have a significant number of successes in people who have moved out of addiction and therefore reduce the likelihood of crime. Domestic um, violence is more difficult to deal with, not least because by the time the case is ready to go to court, the situation may have changed. The relationship between the people involved may have been restored, or um, one of the participants may no longer wish to take the matter before the court for one reason or another but still the risk of offending remains, and we need to try and deal with the source of that too. Okay, folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I am your host, Art Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is the well-abled Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the Chief Officer and the Courts Administrator in uh, the Department of Judicial Administration. Uh, we're talking about justice here in the Cayman Islands. We're going to a commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk uh, some more about the judicial system as well. We'll talk uh, some uh, about uh, restorative, the whole concept of restorative justice. We'll address those of you who uh, believe that, uh, or whose view that uh, we're going soft on crime, we'll, you'll, you know, we'll say to you why it isn't soft as well. And we also want Mr. McCormack to um, explain to us the whole system as much as he can when it comes to uh, foreclosures and the court's involvement in court foreclosures as well. Uh, this one may have surprised him, but <laughs> hopefully he can talk about it. Please stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio I have with me this morning Mr. Kevin McCormack, the Chief Officer and the Courts Administrator in the uh, Department of Judicial Administration. Uh, we have one caller online, so we're going straight to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, gentlemen. Number one from the Bronx. Good morning, number one. How are you? Oh, I'm listening to you quite clear. God, that's good. I hope we. Uh, I hope we are touching some things that you're interested in, and we hope we we're making it interesting for you. Well, I wouldn't be listening to you if it wasn't. <laughs> 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 good morning to your guest. I guess you don't know who I am. Good so morning, Joel and Hunter, sir. Morning. I just called to say that when you asked him a while ago a question about why, when someone pleads guilty, that the sentence are shorter, and so on, so. And he gave you an explanation. Mm -hmm. I agree with him. Instead of going through all this process of finding this 
spending this, doing all kind of things, day after day in the court, mm-hmm. trying to prove something, and you really prove that the person is guilty. That the person came on told you from time, that saved you a whole lot. A and, whole and lot as, of work and money. And as a result, they should get some credit for that. Yeah. Yes. And I said that, that what he's saying there is very good. Mm-hmm. And the way I feel about it, if you're wrong, just come out and say, look, I'm wrong. If you're right, say, look, no, sir, not me, I stand up to the last. Mm-hmm. As for, uh, number one, uh, you know, commenting on the Brock situation, uh, are you happy uh, with the frequency with which the court meets up there to um, to to hear cases, uh, or uh, does it present a challenge when uh, people have to come down to Grand Cayman, for instance, uh, you know, for court cases as well? Because then uh, you're talking about uh, you know financial uh, commitments that they have to make there as well. Well, put it this way, I've never heard no one lately complaining about having to go down to Grand Cayman for this or that because cut the case or put off or this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Different strategies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have really never heard no one complain about it, sir. Not for a long time. That's good to know. That's good to know. Number one again, thank All you. All right. Re- Have a good day and keep up your good work. Thank, thank you very you. much. And thank thanks you. for calling in, um, you know, as well. Uh, the concept of restorative justice um not that i'm aware that it is uh practice prevalently in 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 the cayman islands Mm -hmm. uh can you tell us something about that mr mcconnell yes the 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 general purpose of dealing with criminal offenses is to try and make it less likely that offenses will be committed Mm -hmm. again Mm -hmm. And that has two main aspects. There's what's often called general deterrence, the way in which you create a climate in society that recognizes if you break the rules that society has set for itself, you there will be a sanction, and that the sanction is more onerous than the benefit that will come to you from committing the offense. And the second is more personal in how, where an individual has committed an offense, there can be a response to that sentence that deals both with the individual who committed it and with others who are affected by it. What restorative justice has done is to recognize that there are some situations where the the victims of the crime have a genuine interest in the way in which the offender is dealt with and can benefit from that being done in a collaborative way um, and the offender can often benefit. So it was an approach that was pioneered in parts of Canada and parts of New Zealand and then taken up in Australia and to some extent in England and Wales Mm -hmm. which identifies a way of responding to crime that can either directly involve the victim, gives the victim if they wish to do so the opportunity of talking directly with the offender, of making the offender aware of the impact of the crime upon them um, and the difference it has made. And there are some very positive responses from that. It's a difficult thing for victims to do at times and it needs to be set up and supported properly. Mm -hmm. Another way of dealing with it can be where there is an issue with a larger community. So Uh, One situation I'm aware of is where there was a lot of vandalism in a public park. Children's toys, etc. were dealt with. And the response to the offenders, group of offenders, was to get them to work together to restore it, put it back to how it should have been. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was good for the offenders. It was good for the community. The community interacted with the offenders and strong relationships were built there, which was good in the longer term too. Excellent, excellent. We have a caller online. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning to you, sir, and good morning to your guest. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Miss Daphne Oret, sir, and it's nice to listen to you um, this morning, uh, both of you, in fact. And the subject is one of very, very great importance. Um, I, I wanted to mention, and without keeping you too long on, on the on the air, um, the on the phone rather. Um, the, I served in the Legislative Assembly between 1984 and 1988. Um, while there, 
um, there were a number of things which I discovered, but there were some things when I was able to look deeply into the matter, found out that the sentencing was simply not fitting the crime. Um, first of all, when I got there, I found out that the age of consent was 13. Um, with the help of all the other male um, counterparts there, I was able to get that moved up to 16. And, you know, we had to deal with sentencing. There was nothing on the books against rape or incest. There was uh, a call to sentence for um, lack of maintenance of children. You were able to deal with that. Um, there was um, a number of areas where we needed to focus and we, we were able to get um, more appropriate sentencing. In some cases where there was none, we were able to have the courts deal with it. Um, one of the things that was very, very important there was the appropriate sentencing for spousal abuse, particularly wife abuse. Um, what we found there, sir, was that there was a, a much greater emphasis on sentencing someone for smoking marijuana or dealing with marijuana than it was for someone who abused his spouse. Or in a few cases, we found out that there was women who abused their, 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 their husband. What we found out, sir, was that even if a mother or a father or a neighbor or a friend knew of this spousal abuse taking place, the police at the time, their hands were tied, basically, and they could not do anything, go to arrest the man. When I found out about it, it was only if he did that wife or she did her husband something that required that they go to the hospital and even then if she decided she did not want to pursue this and take it to court that was the end of it in the small community in which i lived in which we live um i found out that this could happen over and over and over again and quite frankly, it wasn't just a matter of what one hears sometimes. It is a matter of what one experiences. So I based everything, and I said, this has to change. What we found out, sir, is that um, the, the, it was a, a matter of sort of hiding things under the mat. I believe that even though things were changed as far as sentencing were concerned, was concerned, and um, the the fact that um, you know the community in many cases, oh well, you know, for goodness' sake, don't take it to court, don't let people know about it, don't let it continued. It continued to the point that sometimes it was frightening. And in many, I, I, while I was there, I also fought tooth and nail to ensure that there was a place of safety for the spouse and the children. Because once, if that individual reported to the police that she was being abused, then when he, he, he found it out, she probably was only subject to more abuse again. The fact that a person uses alcohol or a person uses some type of drug which makes him or her violent is no excuse. Mm -hmm. The fact that a... Call, call on, I'm going to ask you if you can yeah, get to the point because uh, uh, we've gone beyond our commercial uh, break now, but I've allowed you to continue. But if you could get to the point for us, I would appreciate yes. that. What, what I want to say, sir, is I do not believe that once a, a person has abused his wife 
or his children, that the, 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 the spouse can come forward and say to the court, I don't want this to go forward, if, especially if it has taken place more than once, mm-hmm. because I can guarantee you it will continue, and that is something which needs to be looked at carefully, because the end result is that it goes, it keeps on, it continues, and the wife and the children continue to be abused, and the matter accelerates to the point sometimes where it it it, it is almost... Um, in many cases, near fatal before appropriate sentencing is given. I hope that this will be looked into, and thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, caller. When we come back, we're going to talk um, about that, about sentencing uh, for offenses occurring in a domestic uh, context, which is, uh, again, part of the guidelines. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the chief officer and the courts administrator in the Department of Judicial Administration. Please stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. I have in the studio with me Mr. Kevin McCormack, chief officer and the courts administrator in the Department of Judicial Administration. Um, we're going to talk about what our caller uh, just mentioned um, earlier, but before we do that, I want to uh, enumerate the general principles of the sentence and guideline for the benefit of our um, listening audience, Mr. McCormack. And uh, the general principles, one is the aims of the sentencing Two, seriousness of the offense, the principles of culpability and harm. Three, custody, the custody threshold. Four, the principle of proportionality. Five, the totality principle. Six, concurrent slash consecutive sentences. Seven, uh, seven, the sentencing process. Eight, aggravating factors. Nine, mitigating factors. Ten, reduction in sentence for guilty pleas, which you talked about earlier. Uh, 11, reduction in sentence for assistance to the prosecution, uh, prosecuting or enforcement of uh, authorities. 12, reduction in sentence for time spent on remand, subject to conditions um, curtailing liberty. 13, sentencing for offenses occurring in a domestic context, context. And... 14, take, uh, taking offenses into consideration. So let's go to number 13 on the 13th of November 2015. <laughs> sentencing for offenses occurring in a domestic context. Uh, uh, the caller before you know, talked about that and uh, uh, for the victims of domestic offenses coming forward and saying they no longer want a pr- prosecution to proceed. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm grateful to Ms. Daphne for setting out so clearly the complexity of dealing with offences of this type. Yes, yes. There are a whole range of factors that take place, and the ultimate goal is for people to be able to live in a healthy, mutually supportive relationship with each other, um, and as a result to, to thrive, and particularly where there are children involved, for those children to feel safe and to reach maturity. Where violence takes place, it is often difficult to know how best to respond to it. The The pattern and the history over the years is that there is an initial complaint and the RCIPS, I know, have invested heavily in their way of responding to those complaints mm-hmm. over time. Um, we know the refuge has been set up as an additional resource there. By the time the case gets to court, uh, there will, for a variety of reasons, often be a change, and the person who's the victim of the assault does not want to give evidence. Um, Now, the approach that's been developed in some other jurisdictions is to ensure that the evidence gathering at the first point of the first report is more thorough um, and more comprehensive and can be put before the court whether the victim wishes to give evidence or not. Now that can be a challenge because if the defendant denies that the assault has taken place, uh, the court still has to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt of guilt. One of the complexities for the victim is that the person who committed the assault is often the person who is bringing income into the family. And if that person is sent to prison, 
which they may well do if the mm -hmm. offence is proved, they not only lose another person around the home, but they also lose their source of income. So all these factors really have driven the establishment of the Domestic Violence Court. And the aim of that is to do, as Ms. Daphne suggested, to try and bring together the various agencies that are involved and create an environment where, where it's appropriate, the underlying issues are dealt with to enable the parties to live together harmoniously and without violence taking place. There will always continue to be offences that need to be dealt with in the traditional way mm -hmm. they need to go through. Now, what, what you've presented to us there is that, that, that there has to be uh, a quite a working relationship between uh, the judicial administration and other arms and agencies of government when it comes to uh, domestic uh, mm. violence and maybe other cases as well. Yes. And how, how, how does that uh, play out here in the Cayman Islands? The, the best example is the Drug Rehabilitation Court, mm -hmm. uh, and that is a shining example of the different parts of government working together to deal with underlying problems. That has now been operational for over five years um, and is well regarded elsewhere in the region as well as within Cayman. We are now uh, developing a similar approach with both mental health and domestic violence. They are informal in the sense that there is no legal basis for them at the moment, although we hope to be able to move towards doing that in the near future. <coughs> Certainly with the Mental Health Court, um, we have typically seen somewhere between 19 currently and about 30 individuals who come through that court and are provided with greater support than if we just went through the traditional route. Okay. Um, now, there are people who will say, uh, you know, for instance, that despite some of the interventions that we know, for instance, uh, when we see or hear about a spate of burglaries taking place, some people will say, oh, we know who's out of prison now. So it becomes a revolving door for some. And how, how do we deal with those where the whole judicial system and the, in, uh, the prison system becomes a revolving door? Yes. Yeah, th this is a, a complex and difficult problem which every society faces. The, um, the prison service has set up a much more elaborate and developed system of working with offenders to make it less likely that they will continue to commit offences when they come out. Mm -hmm. But the prisons receive people uh, who have already got well advanced in years. Uh, they have been through the school system. Uh, they have been through so many other experiences in their own lives. And that at the age of maybe 17, but typically early 20s or late 20s, the prison service receive this person mm -hmm. and try and work with them. But the government has to adopt a whole system approach. Um, it drives from the initial education. It drives from the ability of parents to create safe environments for children to grow up in and to give them good role models. Uh, we see so much good work being done by men, particularly in taking on responsibility for mentoring young people and we need to create an environment where the alternatives to offending are far more attractive than offending. Certainly, folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I am your host, Orit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is none other than Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the Chief Officer and the Courts Administrator in the Department of Judicial Administration. Please stay tuned. We have lots more to talk about. We want to talk about how these uh, new sentence and guidelines issued by the Chief Justice, how they will help... Um, the legal representative of clients navigate the court system as well and uh, make it easier for them to uh, advise, uh, provide advice to their clients. Please stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. I have in the studio with me Mr. Kevin McCormack, Chief Officer and um, Courts Administrator in the Department of Judicial Administration. We have one caller online. We're going to go straight to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. 
Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, OC, and good morning, Mr. McCormick. Good morning, good morning sir. How are you? Very, very interesting show. Very, very, uh, in, what, well, I must say, an intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, the, the thing I wanted, to, I wanted to mention was that I've read in recent times, you hear about all of these cases that go before the courts and the judges throw them out because prosecution didn't have enough evidence and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if there's some way that they could make sure that Wendy's, I don't know who would be doing it, but that somebody could vet those cases prior to going to the court and say, and look at it and say, I don't think you got enough evidence here because I know it's costing us a lot of money. And when they go to court like that and they lose a the case there, you know, it's costing us money in, in, in different ways. So, mm-hmm. But you have to bear in mind now that the courts have to remain impartial in, in that. And the decision uh, by the courts that there's not sufficient evidence is really they're playing their role in that. Uh, oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I understand that. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. That, that's what I'm saying. Uh-huh. It's, not the courts, it's not the court's fault. What I'm yeah. saying is, from the prosecution standpoint, they must make sure that they're, right. they got all their ducks right. in line and all that kind of thing that before they go to the court, because it seems that's what it is, because it, when the judge throws the cases out, they said, it basically saying, well, how in God thing could you bring this before this court? You know, because you don't have the you don't have the evidence to back your your accusation. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Thank okay. you very much, caller, for that. Uh, before before we um, go to the other point, Mr. McCormick, I just want to read another section of our um, uh, Constitution, Section Seven of the um, of the Bill of Rights, and it says everyone has the right to a fair and public hearing in the determination of his or her legal rights and obligations by an independent and impartial court uh, within a reasonable time. And I just want to concentrate on the phrase within a reasonable time. Um, is that, uh, do, do, do we get that here in the Cayman Islands now, or are there, are there factors that impact on justice being dispensed within a reasonable period of time? Yes, I, I think reasonable term is always difficult to define and d- depends what the comparison is. I think we always strive to have cases dealt with more quickly uh, than many. Some cases are dealt with extremely quickly. They come in, they're dealt with on the first or second hearing, mm-hmm. and uh, that's an end of it. Others can take a lot longer. Compared with many courts across Europe, we do exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can be in some systems across the world where you can wait two, three, four years to get your case before the court and resolved. Uh, it's very rare for us to get anywhere near that. The, the vast majority of cases are dealt with in much shorter periods of time. But the point that was made by our caller just now is an important one mm-hmm. about the, the quality of preparation that goes in. The, the prosecutor in a criminal case will make the decision to prosecute on the basis of of two criteria. Whether there is sufficient evidence to put before the court uh, to raise a reasonable prospect of a conviction and whether it's in the public interest to prosecute. The standard that the court applies is is a tougher one. Um, In order to find somebody guilty of a criminal offence, the court has got to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt. Often the difficulty that our caller referred to to is the fact that uh, the prosecutor will have enough information to satisfy the first test, but for one reason or another, that has not been brought together at the time the court is ready to hear it, and the court has allowed what it considers sufficient time for the prosecution to bring that together. Now, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, the RCIPS have been working closely together to improve the way in which they gather evidence and which they move the evidence between the two. An example of that was a project earlier this year sponsored by the Office of the Governor where a, an experienced prosecutor spent three months here working closely with the DPP's office with the RCIPS to improve and enhance the procedures there. So I'm sure we will always find cases which go wrong. Uh, The number here is very, very small. 
compared with the number in the other jurisdictions in which I have worked. Um, always room for improvement. Okay. Uh, very quickly before we go on to uh, the, uh, the website for a judicial administration, um, the, in relation to the sentencing um, guidelines, I mentioned the fact that, that obviously these will help um, any attorney who's representing his client to be able to give sufficient advice to their client while taking instructions from them also to give advice in terms of you know how this should be dealt with. Um, do you find that lawyers avail themselves to these guidelines and, and are quite conversant with them as well? Generally speaking, that it, that is so. The guidelines develop from those that we use in England. Mm -hmm. The attorneys are generally familiar with those. The difficulty is adjusting those to the different provisions that apply here, which may be the way in which an offence is defined. It may be in the maximum penalty for the offence. So what we're trying to do within the new guidelines is to bring those together into a form that is much easier to find and is written in a way that suits this jurisdiction. So guidelines are regularly referred to. Mm -hmm. Attorneys are by and large familiar with them and how they apply in any particular case. So we're trying to make it simpler for everyone uh, to have access to them in a way that applies and can be understood for K-Man. Okay, let's talk about your, your website now, yeah, sir. thank you. <laughs> yes, this has been quite an exciting development over the last four years or so. There, there was a major revamp of the website um, about four years ago, and we're continuing to develop it, and we're working now on some further developments. But within the website, you can have access to quite a wide range of information. This is www.judicial.ky. There are a number of guidance resources in there. So if you are thinking about whether you need to make a small claim mm -hmm. in civil cases, the Office of the Complaints Commissioner has prepared a very good, helpful guide, contains the forms that you need, uh, working alongside us on that, and that is on our website. If you need to make an application in relation to care of children, again, there's guidance and resources on that and in a number of different areas. If you're interested in what cases are coming before the court, the cause list for every day go up on the website mm -hmm. every day. So they're easy to find there. If you want information about the different types of courts, that is there. The judgments of the court. The most important, though, I think, element is that for the first time, we have brought together the laws that are in force in Cayman. And anyone who wants to find any of the laws that currently apply can do so through our website. That is kept up to date, so every time there is a new law or an amendment to a law, that is included in there. You have to register, but you can get access to the laws without having to pay any fee for that. Okay. Um, in the past, we have seen uh, the court system um, inundated with traffic offences. Do we now have a separate traffic court that deals exclusively with traffic offences and nothing else? We do have a regular traffic court. A magistrate sits in that and deal with, as you say, a large number. The, um, the starting process for many traffic offences is the issue of a ticket. Mm -hmm. The advantage of the ticket is that it can be paid within the convenience of the individual at any time within the time allowed, usually up to 28 days. Uh, but if that's not paid, the person has to come before the court on the day the ticket says. The likelihood is that the amount you'll be required to pay is higher mm -hmm. than if you had paid the ticket. But obviously, if you want to dispute the fact that the offence took place for which the ticket has been issued, then um, you need to attend court, plead not guilty. The case goes through the normal route. But uh, more and more, we all need to be aware of how expensive tickets are. Speeding, I think, is, is the classic. Mm -hmm. um, in many circumstances, we have seen people coming in for speeding, particularly in the 25-mile-an-hour zones, with tickets $300, $400. Wow. 
Uh, it pays to watch the speed. <laughs> it certainly does. Yes. Okay. Um, we have seen the uh, bill for legal aid rise dramatically. Um, more and more people having uh, to resort uh, to legal aid. Uh, so if we can talk about that somewhat. And if you want to um, skirt around, I shouldn't say skirt, if you want to avoid uh, the whole issue of um, who should determine or who should control uh, that part, uh, you know, for legal aid, um, you know, certainly feel free to, to comment on that if you want to also, sir. Thank you. Yes, Article 7 of the, the Bill of Rights makes it clear that um, the state has to provide a system to allow those, particularly those charged with criminal offences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to have legal representation at the expense of the state where that is necessary in the interest of justice and where they are unable to afford to pay for that mm -hmm, themselves. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in criminal offences, the, the prosecution has a lot of resources on its side. It has a team of attorneys. It has all the research capabilities of the enforcement authorities, often the RCIPS, and to leave a defendant on their own when charged with a serious offence is not what you would want to expect if you were ever charged with a criminal offence or in a fair and just society. The legal aid law goes back almost 20 years and reflects a very different situation. The Legislative Assembly has recently passed a new legal aid law and work is underway now on the rules and regulations to accompany that. So we hope to see that coming into force in the not too distant future. And that confirms that the responsibility for the administration of legal aid remains within judicial administration. Um, there will be a new post of director of mm -hmm. legal aid. And we see this as providing an exciting opportunity to provide not only legal aid through the traditional route of funding uh, private attorneys to deliver that service, which they do exceptionally well with very small financial reward compared with what they would achieve if privately funded, but also to develop um, other ways of providing legal advice. Uh, we have been working with the, the law school here to see if we can develop um, a legal advice centre mm -hmm. to support the work that is currently done by the Legal Befrienders Service through the Family Resource Centre. Excellent, excellent. There are so many initiatives um, that are available. Um, the Family Resource Centre in particular has developed a programme for parents who are separating who have children. The tensions that are between parents who separate can be so enormous um, and very difficult for the parents to work out how to manage the children. That program provides an exceptional resource for parents going through that difficult time to work out between themselves how best to manage the needs of the children. Uh, that also that whole concept, what we call alternative dispute resolution, mm -hmm. is an area that we are seeking to promote much more actively. Courts have to be involved in many situations, but there are also cases where it is much better if the parties are assisted to reach resolution of their disputes themselves. Mediation um, is one of the main ways of doing that. Arbitration is another. Um, and we have been working with the Cayman Islands Association of Mediators and Arbitrators to try and develop a program to assist parties coming before the court, particularly in family proceedings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But also, we um, early next year, we're going to be developing that much further to create more situations in which parties will have the opportunities to have a properly trained mediator to assist them in reaching agreement between themselves. Okay, folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I am your host, Dorit Connor. My guest in the studio with me this morning is Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the Chief Officer and the Courts Administrator in the Department of Judicial Administration. Please stay tuned. We're going to take our final break, and when we come back, the conversation will continue. Good morning, and welcome back to For the Record. I have in the studio with me uh, Mr. Kevin McCormack, 
Courts Administrator, Chief Officer in the Department of uh, Judicial Administration. Uh, we want, uh, there are a few more things that we want to talk about. Um, we want to talk about uh, standards in public life, um, uh, breach of trust, uh, the concept of breach of trust. Uh, you heard him mention earlier talking about legal aid, uh, legal aid services. Uh, we've heard uh, Mr. Uh, MacField talk about um, trying to establish um, uh, a section within government or funded by government to be able to do that. And I believe uh, uh, Ms., Mrs. Uh, uh, Theresa uh, Pitcairn has always also been involved with Mr. MacField in that. Uh, Hopefully, we'll have enough time to also talk about the principle of proportionality, and after all of that, to give you also an opportunity to um, to wind up, Mr. McCormack. And we promised that we would get you out of here at 9:30. I'm not sure that we'll be able to do all of that within that period of time. But we're going to go to the phone lines first. Uh, a caller has rejoined us, and we're going to ask that caller. Uh, we're going to limit you to two minutes this time because we want to try to get through the rest of our schedule as well. Caller, good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize for... No, but no, no apologies needed, ma'am. But, but one of the things I will say is that this is a, that this is a, um, this particular uh, meeting this morning um, is certainly one I think which should be continued. There's a lot of things that I'm sure, but thus far, Mr. McCormack, you've done an excellent job in explaining um, what many of us need to know. Yeah, we can have Mr. McCormack host a show that calls that's called "Know Your Legal Rights." <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'll tell you what; I think he'd be a perfect person. But my Certainly. two minutes, my two minutes are going. Okay. So what what I what I'd like to say, sir, is that while I could elaborate or I could um, continue with the subject that we, we I was speaking with you on, um, time is not does not permit me to do that. But I want to offer a suggestion here, if I may. And that is that in the case of spousal abuse, which in most cases is a man abusing a woman, um, is it, could it be considered that an automatic sentencing, once that is established, that this has been done, that automatically that person is inca incarcerated? Um, this thing of saying, okay, you're going to be, uh, this time around, we're giving you a chance, and then you're going to have to go to anger management, um, um, you know, meetings or whatever. In many cases, that does not work. It simply happens, he goes back home, and the first thing that happens, the woman is abused again. She's frightened half to death. She can't say anything, and that is the situation. If it can be proven, that a man abuses, particularly physically abuses, I'm speaking about, his spouse, his wife. I think there should be something automatic because the, the, if he gets a taste of what it's like to say, okay, your first offense, three months. If he realizes in three months, and during that three months, is taking anger management classes or appropriate um, uh, he's, he's, he's dealt with in an appropriate way to try to make things better. But this thing of giving um, someone opportunity after opportunity to go back and do the same thing, because in many cases, um, the, the spouse cannot, dare not say anything. So I, it, 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 this is something which weighs heavily on me. I don't know exactly what we can do about it. But in many cases, it's simply because you're from an, uh, a respectable family in the community, you're in the church, or you're in something else, uh, or you know some other prominent position, and so things are hidden. In other, in many other cases, it's simply because you have a you know you have a situation where the spouse is frightened half to death. I just wondered about whether some automatic sentencing could be in place. Thank you very much, and God bless. Thank you very much, caller. Uh, we have one more caller, so uh, we'll take that call, and then you can respond to both uh, then, Mr. McCormick. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'd like to know if there is a limit to how many times a um, child's case can be postponed. Okay, okay good question, Mr. Yeah. McCormick. 
Uh, no, there, there is no no formal limit. Um, the court will always be looking at the interests of justice um, and trying to balance the rights of both sides to the proceedings in criminal proceedings, prosecutor and defence in civil proceedings called something different. So we have is set... Is that something that you think would be considered? Because a, a lot of times it, it appears that um, when cases keep getting deferred that you know no questions are even asked the lawyers just find flimsy excuses to continue putting them off and yes. it does not appear that any questions are asked or anything to say, well, you know, this is the sixth trial date and, you know, why in the world mm. are you still finding excuses to continue to prolong it? Yeah, I, I think certainly things are moving in that direction already. Uh, you, you may or may not have seen that um, a couple of months ago the Chief Justice published a further practice direction in relation to proceedings in the summary court that set out a, a much stricter procedure for dealing with those and what individuals need to do between hearings. One of the, um, the big incentives, certainly, for those who are legally aided is that attorneys cannot claim for appearance at hearings interim between the early hearings and the final hearings. So there's no financial incentive for those who are legally aided to, um, to continue to develop court hearings for as long as possible. So yes, we, we all want to get to the position where a case can come before the court for a first hearing. If it can't be resolved at that first hearing, there is a single postponement and the matter is dealt with at the second. Uh, but inevitably, things don't always go that way. Coming back to the first caller and the mandatory sentence for domestic violence, this doesn't have a very good history uh, in this type of context. The result tends to be that if there is a mandatory period of imprisonment following first conviction, that means that even less incidences of domestic violence are reported to the police. The consequences are simply too great. Another difficulty that comes from that, of course, is that if a person goes to prison, the likelihood is that when they come out of prison, they will not have a job to go to, or certainly not straight away. If they don't have a job to go to, they don't have any income. If they don't have any income, what are they going to do? Are they likely to get into other sorts of criminal activity? Are they likely to be more prone um, to resort to drink or drugs, to resort to violence? So um, there are a whole range of ways that are open to the court. Certainly courts treat violence that takes place in a domestic context very seriously. Imprisonment isn't always the best solution. Okay. Caller, uh, are you still there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would need an excuse for them. Shouldn't be anyway. It's a good idea. Yeah. 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 At least it shouldn't cost government as much when they give them a house. Yes. Arrest. Okay. Caller, um, I want to thank you very much for uh, for your question, and I I, I hope um, you know Mr. McCormick, uh, you know, uh, was clear and and certainly uh, helped to uh, clarify things for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, very quickly. Um, Standards in public life, um, you know, with the introduction of that here in the Cayman Islands, uh, bringing more uh, uh, public officials, uh, you know, under uh, under scrutiny and and certainly setting guidelines for them. The whole concept of uh, uh, breach of trust, not only in the pu pu um, public sector but also in the pri private sector as well. Uh, any quick comments on that, and then on the principles of proportionality. Yeah, I think there is a very good principle that much is expected of those to whom much is given. given. Yep. And we see that too in terms of the criminal law. So those who are placed in positions of responsibility have a greater obligation. Mm -hmm. And the consequences of breaching that obligation are more severe. Across um, the English-speaking jurisdiction, those who breach trust, particularly breach of financial trust, can expect to go to prison as a result of that. They are almost always first offenders. Um, they would not have been put in that position of trust if they weren't. You can almost guarantee that they will never offend again. 
um, because that's the type of person they are and they will never be put in a position where they can have that opportunity in the way they did before. But nonetheless, it is a recognition of the fact that uh, accepting a position of responsibility places that higher level of trust upon you. And therefore, you must expect a more severe consequence if you breach that position of trust. Okay. Proportionality is always a challenge. Um, how do you decide what punishment fits the crime? Those of us who are familiar with the works of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan and the Mikado <laughs> in particular uh, can see the very many innovative ways that there are in, in matching the crime. It, it is always a question of judgment, and that changes over time. Uh, if you go back a hundred years, approaches to crime and punishment will be different from what they are now. If you go forward a hundred years, again, they will be different. Uh, and each society has to make its own judgment about what is going to be effective in responding to criminal activity. Okay. Opportunity for final comments, Mr. McCormack. I think the Cayman Islands is a wonderful place to live. Um, that there is a great deal of good work that is going on across society to build a strong, resilient society. And it will be wonderful to see the effects of that over the coming years. Uh, and the quality of our judicial service, uh, do you find that that is one of the attributes that will continue, that we can use not only in terms of having tourism and financial services, but um, a good uh, legal jurisdiction as well? Yes, indeed. The, the caliber of our judiciary, judges and magistrates, um, the caliber of the staff that we employ within judicial administration, give us optimism for the future. If we are successful in creating a new court facility, we will be able to provide a quality of service that is much higher than we are able to now. Mm -hmm. Now, in my introductory uh, comments, I always say that this show is, uh, you know, to provide, you know, information um, and uh, issues as they arise and take place on the local, regional and international scene. On the regional scene, uh, we see in Jamaica now the whole debate of whether or not to adopt the CCJ um, as uh, the, le um, the final court for Jamaica. Um, we have seen some other countries, uh, I believe it's uh, Guyana, Belize, uh, uh, possibly Trinidad to a certain extent, who have uh, moved away from the Privy Council. We're probably years down the line before we will be faced uh, with that challenge, but uh, any, any personal views on that, sir? The number of cases that go to the Privy Council from here are very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, I think we just saw one recently in the papers. That just yes, strangely, yes. yes. <laughs> one decision yesterday, but I yeah. think that was the only application that went to the Privy Council last uh, last year from a decision of the courts here. We have a very effective court of appeal here. Um, uh, we have very high caliber judges who sit on the court of appeal, and that I think provides a very efficient system for us. Whether in the longer term, if the remainder of the region goes along one route, it would be more sensible for us to do the same, will be a decision that will, I'm sure, need to be considered at mm -hmm. some stage in the future. But for the present, um, having our own strong court of appeal works well for us. Well, Mr. McCormick, I want to thank you very much. Uh, you have made, for the record, live up to its expectations and its promise to deliver uh, to our listening audience, uh, and certainly by the uh, quality of the interaction that we had with our callers this morning, uh, speaks volumes in terms of the far-reaching nature of uh, this, this discussion this morning. And I simply want to extend an uh, open welcome you, to you and uh, those within uh, the judicial administration uh, to come to For the Record, uh, you know, at any point in time that you may want to do so and that we can accommodate you uh, so that you can certainly um, get your uh, points and your concerns and your uh, issues across to our listening audience as well. I, again, I want to thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Jose. I much appreciate it.
Folks, I want to remind you that you've been listening to For the Record. I've been your host, Orit Connor. My guest this morning with me was Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the courts administrator, but also the chief officer in the Department of Judicial Administration. I want to remind you that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. There is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are, and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I would suggest that you donate to a worthy charity. We always want to consider those who need and not necessarily those who want. I say to you, have a great day uh, with Pirates Week coming up as well. Please stay safe, be considerate, um, and also um, uh, you want to be very careful and be uh, whatever you do, do it in moderation as well. God bless. Have a great weekend. Uh, on Monday, you will join... Um, Miss Donna Bush, and she will be having Premier Honorable Alden McLaughlin on with her on Monday morning as well. God bless. Have a great day.